Thank you very much for your interest in this presentation. So today we will be talking about nutrition and beyond, the challenges faced by the global shrimp industry. On this uh, slide from the latest goal survey, you can see the list of all the challenges faced by uh, farmers around the world, and more specifically in this case, in Asia. As you can see, uh, disease is really critical. Actually, disease is always ranked as the most important uh, challenge for farmers. It's not surprising when you consider all the diseases that have been affecting farmers since the beginning, with white spots and more recently EMS, HPND, and EHP. Now, when we look at that, we can look at the different goal survey since 2017, 18, and 19, and look at the priority uh, for the farmers. In 2017, the focus was on seed quality and on disease-free rootstock. Actually, this means disease, because both of these are critical in order to control, uh, to manage disease uh, challenges. In 2018, in addition to banned chemicals, again, linked to disease, there was a renewed interest in price, in personal price and then the production cost, feed. In 2019, we have again a focus on production cost, feed, and then disease-free food stock. That means in the last two years, in addition to disease, production cost, feed became very important for farmers. Now, as a farmer, how can they handle this issue of production and feed cost? Many of them may consider reduction investing in biosecurity, products, protocols, but also post quality uh, price. And it means uh, with a lower price investment in PL, you may have also a lower quality of PL and also reduction in the feed with the risk of investing in lower quality feed and finally staff. Now, when you look at all of these, uh, options for farmers, it's important to look at the factors that are affecting the performance of a diet in feed. And this nice slide from Albert Taken um, reviewed all the factors that are affecting the performance of a diet or feed. And half of them actually control by the filming of the feed coming. That means the formulation, the nutrition level that you have in your diet, but also the processing and the transportation. The other half is affected by the, affected by the farmer. And in there, you will see the production system, the water quality, but also the management of the feeding. What it means is for a farm to reduce investment in biosecurity, products, protocol, and PL price may have also a negative impact on the performance of a good quality diet to be provided by Fidia. Um, in our site, on our point of view, we are rather looking at um, improving the production efficiency. And what it means, working at reducing the risk of disease, but also working with stronger post larvae, and then estimating the cost benefit of each product and protocols. Now, everything starts with genetics, which is the material that a farmer will start from um, for his uh, production. <clears throat> now, there are a large number of genetic programs around the world, and many of them with either work on selection for growth or for robustness or disease resistance or tolerance. I want to emphasize that genetics is just the material, the starting point. What matters is what you do then with this genetic material to make sure it express its potential. And then we have to look at what's going on throughout the cycle, from the broodstock to the hatchery, the nursery, and then the farm to go out. In the case of the broodstock, you have your genetic material. The next step is to make sure you don't have contamination by pathogens in your maturation facility, but also that you have the right diet or the right management to get the best output per female, and that the nuclei that are produced by this broodstock will perform well in the hatchery. Hatchery, one more time, you have to look at the risk of contamination by pathogens, and then make sure these animals perform well in the larval rearing, that means good growth and good survival. And of course, the peer that you produce in the hatchery will perform well later on in the production cycle. Now, uh, with um, EMS hitting farmers a few years ago, there was a renewed interest in shrimp nursery. I want to emphasize the fact that different models, different design of nursery, and each of them will have a different objective. On the right, you can see two pictures showing two different approaches. One of them going into high investment, zero water exchange, very controlled by security. 
another one going with a low investment in infrastructure, focusing maybe more on water exchange. Now, different design, different objectives. Some of them may focus on growth, others may focus on biosecurity, on consistency, predictability, and others may focus on their own farm crop rotation. On this table, we've tried to summarize the, diff, the three different approaches to shrimp nursery and what it means. What we call the booster model is actually focusing on growth. In this case, you may stock a very large number of PLs per liter, have a shorter culture period, and harvest shorter animals, but it may require higher water exchange. The second model of nursing, we focus on biosecurity and consistency. In this case, we reduce the stocking density, we increase the culture period, and we, hire, uh, we harvest slightly larger animals. We have lower water exchange. And finally, we have the multi-phase. In this case, we focus on farm crop rotation. Much smaller stocking density, which actually very similar to those of grow at homes. And we have also outdoor conditions. We may have longer culture periods with larger animals harvested. Now, according to the different models, we may have a benefit in working with specific protocols and diets. In the booster approach, that means focusing on the growth, there's an interest to look at quality diets. And that means working with quality ingredients, balanced formulation, but also stable diet with the right palatability. And the work that we did here um, in, uh, in this case, we compared the performance of uh, mini pellets to crumbled or other microextruded pellets from competition. And we could document that an investment in a higher nutrition profile of this diet, with good stability and palatability, gave obviously better performance of the animal, better growth, as you can see there. At the same time, if you have better growth, you can also have better FCR. This is what we had here. So it's not really surprising if we invest in high quality diet, we can expect better growth and better FCR. What is interesting is to look, of course, at the financial. In this case, this graph gives you an overview of the revenue to the farmer by investing in this higher quality diet. As you can see, whether you compare to crumbled or microextruded, investing in a higher quality diet gives a better return to the farmer. The nursing approach. In this case, we are more looking at health enhancers. Now, there's a lot of work over the last 20 years documenting the benefit of vitamins, whether it is vitamin C, vitamin E, but also amino acids, nucleotides, and immunostimulants. All of these have been shown to improve the performance of shrimp when faced with stress, salinity stress, but also a disease uh, challenge, pressure on them. So what we've done is developing specific uh, supplement diet, health enhancers. They can be applied to the, uh, to the nursery with the benefit of improving the risk of shrimp to stress, but also improving its survival, as you can see here. Now, if you compare the two different models, one of them would be uh, you take more risk. That means you focus on larger size animal, bigger biomass into your tank. But the consequence is that you may focus on cost, you may have issues with biosecurity or cost. The other one, you look at risk management. That means you focus on biosecurity, uh, cost control, cost optimization, but you have less biomass into your tank. This is really the nursing approach. And if we look at uh, data from the commercial operations, in this case, Thailand, um, we looked at the performance of uh, these approaches versus a model. Um, with um, animal stock at 3.7 PLs per liter over 25 days. As you can see, you have very nice consistent growth in three different uh, replicates that were done over there. Now, interestingly, when you look at the production cost uh, per kilo of juveniles, you can see a dramatic reduction in the cost, production cost, if you switch from the old model to a kind of nursing approach. So there's a financial benefit for the farmer by switching from that one to the nursing approach. Now, the work we did in Vietnam, in this case, two PLs per liter for 24 days, uh, we looked at the cost uh, analysis more in details. As you can see, control versus um, our recommended protocols, the total cost is reduced by 14%. But what is interesting is to see that we are switching from an investment in water treatment, power, and labor into higher diet. 
to invest more in light will reduce dramatically your investment in all the other segments. And the end result is that you have a reduction in your production costs. The multi-phase approach is basically a combination of both health and nutritional products. And what we are doing is looking at the traditional way of rearing shrimp, where you have a three-month growth cycle. In a year, that means you're going to have three, four crops. And what we're trying to do is to reduce the period of time that the farmer um, cultivated shrimp in outdoor ponds. And by doing it, what you do is that you optimize the use of your pond and you move from four crops to maybe six crops per year. So it's more financially beneficial to the farmer. Now, uh, farmers have been affected by disease, whether it is um, EHP, HPND, and all these affect productivity. On this graph, it's a review that was done by my colleague, Andy Shin, and he looked at the impact of EMS in Thailand over the last few years, estimated as over eight, almost $8 billion loss, the impact just of uh, EMS HPND in Thailand. Now, when we look at uh, EHP, EHP is affecting the ability of shrimp to digest feed, to um, assimilate nutrients, and therefore it will affect its growth. And the consequence of that is you have low growth rate, but you also have a dramatic impact on the FCR. Again, a feed cost. It's an example of a stable, predictable production. And it's an example of what we do in Vietnam. In this case, we work with zero water exchange system. That means you prepare your water, control it, reduce the input of pathogens through water exchange. And you have also very controlled uh, conditions with shading. The benefit of that is for a farmer, you can predict really your output crop after crop. Now, farmers may switch, may I decide to go the other extreme, which is actually reduction in investment in all diet. In this case, what you can see is farmers may decide to ferment uh, raw materials, such as soybean, prepare them together with probiotics. And the idea being that you provide a cheaper nutritional source and expect provide as well productive into your pond. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of issues with that. Um, this is something that was summarized uh, by Albert Taken in Bangkok in 2015, where he looked at some of the impact of these um, management of farmer on site, where they would coat, mix, um, diet with uh, secret ingredients. The consequence being that you lose the stability of your diet, you can affect the palatability, but also the nutrition. Now, if people look at brewing with the benefit of uh, probiotics, we can look at different ways of uh, controlling the gut microflora of shrimp uh, with probiotics by basically incorporating these directly into the feed. And so it can be done. In this case, you will have an oil tank where you would mix your probiotics. This one would go to an oil coater. The feed, after pelleting or extrusion, would be coated with the probiotic oil mixture. And then you basically have a feed ready to be delivered to the farm with the benefit of the product in the feed. Now, what we've done, of course, is looking at the benefits of applying this product on the feed. As what you can see here is in different kind of rearing model, we looked at the recovery of our bacillus, which are put on the feed, and how you can recover them into the gut. So you can see first a column, you do not have any bacillus recovery, second column, bacillus. Third, same, fourth, recovered. The benefit is to see that you can recover the bacillus inside the gut of the shrimp. At the same time, you can reduce the vibrio in the same gut. So you display the vibrio and replace them with favorable bacteria. For the farmer, what is the benefit of that? Well, of course, one of them is to see how you can help farmer cope with disease such as CMS. In this work we did in Vietnam, we could document how by including the probiotic in the feed, we can improve the survival of the shrimp by 65%. Similarly, if you apply the probiotics in the feed, we can expect some benefit on the uh, feed conversion. The probiotics helping the shrimp assimilate the nutrients. This is something we did in uh, Thailand, and we could document how by increasing the inclusion rate of probiotics in the feed, we can improve even further the FCR. Now, as a conclusion, um, how can we cope with the feed cost issue? We believe we have to focus on production efficiency and productivity. And what it means is work on the shrimp genetics, yes, but especially the maturation. And what it means, make the most out of the genetic material 
in the form of good and invested people. Next, have the right hatchery and nursery protocol for the operation. And look at the cost effective use of health boosters and quality feed. But all of these have to be adapted to the conditions. It means each protocol, whether it is maturation, hatchery, nursery, or farm, has to be adapted to the conditions of the market. Thank you very much.